Hey girl, Marissa here. You are listening to the Codepend Dummy Podcast. As a young woman, you have been raised, reinforced, and rewarded for putting the needs of others above your own. That is for being codependent. Now in your 20s, you're exhausted, exasperated, and enveloped in crap relationships, especially the one you have with yourself. This podcast is to help you undo all that so you can stop playing small and start taking up space. You dummy. Let's get to it. All right. Today, we have Jennifer Loop, a licensed psychotherapist and yoga instructor, seeing clients online that live in California. She specializes in working with codependents, especially with women who are feeling anxious and stressed in their relationships with loved ones. She also specializes in substance abuse, working with individuals who want to quit or cut down on their alcohol or marijuana use. Jenny uses mindfulness, somatic, cognitive, and trauma-focused approaches to support her clients in growing and healing. Jennifer, Jenny, (laughs) any preference? Uh, Jenny. Jenny, welcome yeah. to the Code Pandemic podcast. Thank you. Thank you for coming That's, on. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're little Code Pandemics here <laughs> on our journey to self awareness, self knowledge, self acceptance. Codependency is such a vague, overstated, under understood term. Yeah, totally. So how do you define codependency? Yeah, I was just going to say that it's like most people have heard the term before, but I think they misunderstand what it is. They just think of it as dependency um, in general, just being really attached to somebody. Mm -hmm. But um, even therapists, I find, like, don't really know what it means. Um, People in my grad program. And so... Yeah, to me, it means just a lot of the different characteristics of it are people that feel responsible for other people's problems, uh, for other people's feelings, for uh, that have a hard time saying no and um, tend to people please and have a hard time setting boundaries, expressing like feelings and needs. So um, in general, they just don't leave a lot of room for themselves. Yeah. Mm. I love that last part. People who tend to not leave a lot of room Mm -hmm. for themselves. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, Jenny, can you (laughs) share some examples of codependency in your own life? Yeah. um, So in my 20s or so, I was dating people and I haven't always had the best picker, but I tended to stay in relationships probably for longer than I should have. So for Mm -hmm. me, I think it it looks a bit more like um, love addiction. You might call it love addiction or like attachment, you know, issue, um, whatever it is, but uh, yeah. And also just, you know, having trouble with expressing expressing things or feeling bad about, you know, things and dating situations and not, not wanting to express it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So during your twenties, your picker, your picker was broken. Yeah. You're picking what, who? (laughs) Um, A lot of people that were uh, struggling with like mental illness, suicidality, um, and or substance abuse and I was also you know using a lot of drugs and alcohol um but I think I tended to pick people that used more than I did Mm -hmm. so I would also I think part of the codependency for me was trying to get them to change you know um rather than leaving the relationship just kind of staying in it and keeping on trying to get them to change whether it was like trying to get them to quit alcohol or drugs or trying to get them to like get a better job or something like that. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. (laughs) Can you reflecting back, 
right? Your picker picking all these guys, Mm -hmm. mental illness, substance abuse. And girls. And girls. Mm Mm-hmm. Picking these guys and girls. Can you think of, just try, you can give one example or two if it's like, oh God, such a, such a hard, or like the quintessential, which, which one of them did you try the most to get them to change? Hmm. I think it, mm. Probably a guy that I dated. Um, I was trying to get him to to get a better job. And I was also getting sober when I was with him. So I think I preferred that he got sober, but mostly I was trying to get him to change to get a, a better job. Yeah. And what, right, in the depths of your, like, right, you were trying the most. What did that look like, feel like? you know, just trying to share yeah. with the listener, like this is um, what, this is what my trying to get them to change. Yeah. Just like. a lot of like conversations about like, Oh, you know, that about it, like a lot of long conversations um, and just trying to come up with different things that he could apply to or do. And um eventually kind of telling him that I was going to maybe see other people if he didn't, you know, kind of trying to set an ultimatum around it. And yeah, I think I was just, you know, very attached and and didn't want to leave that situation, even though I was unhappy and didn't really, um, you know, look out for qualities. Like I didn't really look used to look for qualities in people that I would want to date, you know, Um, it just kind of ended up happening, but I never really thought before about, about like what I wanted in a partner. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So long conversations. Yeah. (laughs) About, right. Helping him get, you're like, you need to get a job. (laughs) Or a better job. Better job. Or more hours, you know, all those kind of things. More hours. Yeah. And you're like trying to come up with ideas. (laughs) <laughs> could do this you could do this oh I saw this place is hiring yeah so strategizing problem solving yeah mm-hmm. ultimatums mm-hmm. if yeah. you don't <laughs> I'm gonna start dating other people mm-hmm. <laughs> did you or was it uh MD? I did a little bit yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> it didn't really go that well so. <laughs> yeah. and like you said you were you were just attached to him Mm -hmm. unhappy in the relationship it wasn't like there had been a lot of reflection values that you were looking for in a partner you were just trying to make him fit into what you wanted and needed but Mm -hmm. you could have just met a guy who had a job who was working hours but you're like no can you just right I'm trying to get you to change so I can stay. Yeah, I think he met my needs for like a time, you know, a certain amount of time. And then I realized, wait a minute, like you don't want to buy some essential things, you know, that are really essential. And so that's when it kind of like, it turned for me. I was like, oh, okay. This is not really something that I want. Right. And right, this, you sensing that you didn't really look, for things and partners it just happened and then mm-hmm. you would try and make it work yeah it was just like oh you look cute you smell good you know you <laughs> like just, me yeah <laughs> you're interested mm-hmm. yeah I know I, I you know I've shared about a couple dating adventures I've had so one guy I dated I tended to find alcoholics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, unconsciously, I just, I sense I would sniff them out. (laughs) And I remember one ex we dated for a year, codependent AF. I'll talk about another episode listeners, but we had a one night stand 
that I barely remembered. Mm. I woke up in the morning, was like, where am I? Who is this? And he reached out and we dated for a year. Like no, no, no thought intention. Like just, oh, oh, you like me? Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I sense I did that because I didn't have or had very little self-worth value. Like, mm-hmm. like how can I order from the restaurant? Like you want to, like, you're going to feed me. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For me, I felt like there was probably not very much guidance in that area from my parents or, you know, anywhere really. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause they, my parents met when they were 15 in, in church, like church choir or something. So neither of them really did much dating and they just got married in their early twenties Wow. and didn't really like, they don't really talk about uh, that kind of stuff either. So, right. yeah. Yeah. So we're looking at you, mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I won't show them this. <laughs> yeah, we talk about parents. Influence. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so for for you, right? Codependency, uh, not leaving a lot of room on your plate, trying to get others to change. You experience that in your own life. Mm-hmm. And related to your specialty one of your specialties, substance abuse. Yeah. How do codependency and substance abuse relate? Yeah. So usually people think of the codependent as being in a relationship with, you know, either a romantic relationship with an addict or alcoholic, or, um, you know, that maybe their parent or sibling is, is an alcoholic or an addict. Um, and so oftentimes that is the case. Um, and the, the codependent is trying to get the, the addict to change and trying to get them to get sober and going crazy kind of doing that. And, um, but I realized I worked at a drug rehab for a year and a half. And I realized that um, a lot of the addicts were also uh, codependent or had, mm-hmm. you know, trouble with setting boundaries and expressing feelings and needs. And um, I think a lot of people that are using are kind of numb, you know, use alcohol or drugs to numb themselves and to kind of stay in relationships that they're not happy with. Um, And they also, like, for instance, when some people are trying to quit um, or like cut down on using alcohol or drugs, they might, um, feel like they want to make another person feel comfortable by drinking or by using, you know, Mm. they're hanging out with somebody that's drinking and they like, like you say a lot, like I want to make myself uncomfortable to make the other person feel comfortable. Right. Um, It reminds me of that. Right. So you're working in this drug rehab a year and a half and you realized, wait, it's not an, (laughs) an, a addict, alcoholic, codependent pair, right? Either Mm -hmm. a friend, romantic relationship or familial. It's, you're like, oh my gosh, these addicts are codependent. (laughs) Yeah. How did you come to that realization and how come you sense you had to, like, how come that isn't known in like, how come you had to realize that? Mm, I don't know. I mean, maybe I thought of it before I worked there, but um, I mean, they talk a lot about boundaries and 12 step programs in general, but just from talking, you know, doing therapy with some of them and group therapy, um, I think a lot of them want to, they, they don't want to share their feelings with people. They want to avoid sharing their feelings and, and expressing needs and um and sometimes that can lead to that numbing you know that not wanting to feel and just staying in a certain situation staying in certain jobs um staying in relationships um staying in maybe a housing situation and just using instead to kind of deal with that problem instead of you know expressing 
making a change. Right. So, staying. Yeah. You're like, man, these people are staying and using and using and staying. Mm-hmm. Codependence stay. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and then when you're trying to get sober and you have a, uh, like a partner that's still using, there's a lot of, um, you know, boundaries that come into play there and, and with friends as well. Um, like when I was, was getting sober, I had to, you know, say that I wasn't comfortable with there being drugs or alcohol in my house and, you know, had to, um, you know, cut some people off basically because they were using in my house and it ended up making me relapse. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, boundaries are, are huge with recovery. Right. And when did you get sober? Um, about 10 years ago, April, April 1st, <laughs> really April 2nd, but I like to say April 1st <laughs> <How come>? so, <laughs> cause it's April fool's day. I don't mm. know. That was the last day that I used. So, wow. Yeah. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're starting to share. We're hearing how, yeah, textbook, we think of alcoholic codependent. Mm -hmm. And now you're saying it might be an alcoholic codependent and an alcoholic codependent. They just <laughs> both might be abusing a substance and also codependent. What are some other ways that you've really seen codependency in active addiction? Hmm. <laughs> I think I have a list here that I can refer to really quick. Um, well, like I was saying, like drinking or using to make other people feel comfortable, you know, you get invited to go to the bar with your friend and they're drinking and then you feel like you have to. I had a friend that that was doing that, that just mm -hmm. felt uncomfortable sitting there and not drinking, felt like it was rude or something. Um, Yeah. Um, drinking or using to have more courage to do something you might not normally do, like, like a threesome or, you know, a one night stand. Something or like even that. talk about feelings, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, How many times one. have, or had I gotten drunk to tell my boyfriend, I don't know, that hurt my feelings when, mm -hmm. right? Couldn't do it sober. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or to, you know, feel comfortable um, having sex sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right, just sensing ways in active drinking substance abuse, it could be to make another person drinking or using comfortable. Mm -hmm. Intimacy, right? Sex with someone else or even threesomes or being more adventurous that way. And also, right, we said like to express feelings or sentiment that you just can't sober. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing I was thinking of is that I had a roommate um, who told me when I was trying to get sober that I was more fun when I was fucked up. Mm -hmm. Are we allowed to say that word here? I don't Fuck know. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the, the sad, like that was really frustrating when he said that, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was hard, but then he, the sad thing about that is that he ended up overdosing, um, many years later. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So right. Multiple reasons that people in active addiction, alcoholism can also be codependent right? To stay, we emphasize that too, staying in jobs, relationships, living situations that aren't mm -hmm. in alignment, maybe with what they truly want, but having to somehow cope with that. Yeah. And then, right, for a codependent like you, trying to get sober, being told by a friend and roommate, mm -hmm. you're boring, sober. Yeah. <laughs> What's a codependent trying to get sober 
Jennifer to do. Like you're like, well, fuck. Yeah. I guess let me <laughs> let me go get higher. Let me go yeah. drink. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think eventually I did, but I don't I don't know if it was because of him or not, but maybe it had something to do with it. Right. It didn't help. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Right, because we're not leaving a lot of room on our plate. Or leaving, yeah, a lot of room for ourselves. We're trying to get others to change. And also right? Like these relationships that you had were very attached and just trying to stay in relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes, I will, I will, I will use, I don't want to be boring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like a way of avoiding change using. Mm. And when you've witnessed addicts, alcoholics, get clean and sober, how can their codependency potentially pop off without the substance? Hmm. I mean, I think it's still like, you can still be that way without the substance. You know, Mm -hmm. you can still have a hard time saying no to people and, um, you know, with expressing your feelings and needs. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's more clear. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we're not numbing to stay. We're just staying and like, oh God, I am staying and not happy. (sighs) Yeah. And I have nothing to numb that with. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I think when I, um, when I got sober, I, uh, finished an album and I also went to grad school. <laughs> so I made, made a lot of changes when I got sober. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you sense that helped or hurt? I, I think it helped getting sober. Yeah, for sure. Cause it, it made me finish things and, and do things that I wasn't doing. You know, I was just kind of staying in, in situations mm. that, um, weren't as appealing. Right. And in your career, working with codependents, how have you seen what they've been through, right? We're talking about mm-hmm. 20s, young adulthood. Where have you seen that really begin in their younger life? I think um, oftentimes it comes from being parentified when they were a kid. So being kind of made, put into the parent role, um, and told that they're responsible for keeping the family together or being talked to by one of their parents in a way that's kind of inappropriate, you know, that's um, where the parent is is kind of using them more as a confidant or a friend Mm -hmm. instead of being their parent. Um, Yeah. So it can happen through uh, parentification and also, I think abuse, you know, whether it's emotional, physical, sexual, or, or neglect um, can kind of make it feel like it's not safe to express your feelings or needs. Like mm-hmm. if you're in a household that um, where it's not really okay to express feelings or you might get punished for that, there might be anger around when you express feelings. It can be um, harder that way. So. Mm-hmm. Parentification, Mm -hmm. abuse, feelings not welcomed all contribute. Yeah, yeah. And that one actually contributes to substance abuse as well. I mean, I'm sure all of those, but but the feelings in particular, not welcome. Right. Um, More rigid boundaries, like with feelings, can contribute to uh, substance abuse later on. So. Mm -hmm. And can you try, Jennifer, to give us 
like a concrete example of each. So whether your own life or a client, like example of parentification. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're told by a parent or by somebody else, like maybe a therapist that you're responsible for your keeping your family together, that, um, that you're the glue that helps keep them together, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, that when you have a parent that is, is confiding in you and kind of telling you about their personal problems, their problems with their marriage and things like that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, as you're speaking, I've actually had patients who have been told by their parents, I stayed for you, right? Or like, like, and, and like very young, like they were like 12, yeah. 15. I'm not sure if it happened before 10. And I don't know why I just said that because age doesn't matter. As long as you're a child in a household, you're a child in a household. And right, the guilt, burden, shame yeah for being told oh my god he or she stayed here because of me yeah yeah, yeah okay I've heard that one too I've heard that one so parentified mm -hmm. and then do you have an example of abuse that you really right everybody it's not a causation right? This abuse or this experience led to the development of codependency. Mm -hmm. Also just like, do you have an example? I think a lot of the time emotional abuse is harder for us to understand. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example of that? Yeah. I mean, if a parent has an anger issue, if mm -hmm. they have, um, you know, an, a narcissism, and um, they might be either physically or, and also like emotionally abusive, say things that um, are just kind of crossing boundaries, inappropriate and, and having a lot of anger and that might make it, you kind of play small and you don't wanna disrupt things, you know, too much and wanna be like a good girl so you're not, ruffling the feathers and, and causing more anger or abuse. Okay. So angry parent. And you, mm -hmm. you said narcissism mm -hmm. for codependemies 101. What's, yeah. what's narcissism? <laughs> what's a narcissistic parent? Like narcissistic parents, um, often abusive, can be emotionally abusive, physically abusive. Um, they may gaslight, um, so might make you kind of say things and and to make you feel like you're crazy or like invalidate your your experience. Basically, mm -hmm. um, some of them will act like they like. Um, they're really proud of their child on the outside, like to social media. Um, and then they won't act like that with their child. Actually, mm -hmm. they won't like say, Hey, you did a great job at this or that, but they'll kind of make, you know, play the game of that and show it to everybody on, on social media or, you know, in public out with, with um, people that they know, but they don't really praise their, their kids. So it kind of feels like this, um, yeah, it's just done for appearance. That's one thing I've heard a lot that's done. Right. Mm -hmm. And an example of feelings not being allowed at home. Mm -hmm. mm, an example of that is if your maybe your family is focused on being very positive Mm -hmm. um, and so anytime you have any kind of negative emotion, it's kind of brushed aside and, um, maybe they change the subject 
uh, something like that. Right. I don't know why, but if anyone's seen Succession on HBO, (laughs) there aren't many children in the show, but one of the main characters, his, his name, I can't recall right now, but he, long story short, he manslaughtered someone. I don't know. Have you seen it? Mm Mm-mm. Okay, so he's, I I believe he's higher. He's going to get high and he's driving with a passenger and they drive off a bridge, land in water and a river. And he ends up, you know, trying to get both his and this passenger seatbelt unbuckled and he couldn't, he couldn't get it. Mm. So he freed himself, swam to the top and to the shore. I don't know, went and hid somewhere, got cleaned up. And I believe the passenger died, right? Manslaughter. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, the guilt, the shame. And he goes to his mom very soon after. And you can tell, like, he looks like shit, right? Eyes are red, you know, face is sunken. Maybe he hasn't slept. And he's like, mom, I have to tell you something. Mm. And I cannot remember... But in so many words, she's like, you know, maybe you shouldn't. And he's like, Mm. yeah, no, I shouldn't. And you can just tell, like, suppress and repress. And yeah, I was like, damn, if she's doing that when he's in his probably 30s or 40s, how many times before that in his childhood was he told more of the same? Like, "Mm, you, you probably shouldn't talk to me about your feelings in so many words, you know? Yeah. 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 It's so interesting that he is an actual addict. They're doing a good job portraying that. Yeah. Good job HBO. (laughs) Yeah. And then it just makes you want to hide your feelings and then you end up using to deal with the feelings. Mm -hmm. So. mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I can't. Yeah. It's been a while since I watched it. So I can't remember his name. Okay, I'll put in the show notes, everybody. It's a, it's a really <laughs> sad, sad episode, but it's good. Okay, well, how, first of all, your specialties, right? I read mm-hmm. them off. Mindfulness, somatic, yeah. cognitive, trauma-focused. What, what are mindfulness and somatic approaches? Yeah, um, so mindfulness is just kind of using tools and awareness to get yourself more into the present moment and to like use your senses, um, your breath and your, your get into your body um, so that you're not, you know, so focused on the future, which would be more associated with anxiety or focused more on the past, which be, you know, associated more with depression. Um, And yeah, I use, um, and then what is somatic? Yeah. Um, so what, uh, some somatic approaches are um, kind of allowing the client to get in touch with where they feel the feeling in their body mm-hmm. um, and what does it look like? Like, what does it feel like? What color would it be if it were a color? Um, what temperature would it be? What texture would it be? And um And then to kind of just like go in towards that, that feeling um, is one approach I use a lot. And also I use guided meditation. Sometimes at the beginning of sessions, we'll do um, five minutes of uh, guided meditation and meditation is very much a somatic approach. And, and so is EMDR. I know you're familiar with that. So Mm -hmm. um, I'm starting to use EMDR now in my practice. Awesome. And for the codependent dummy, yeah, what's EMDR? <laughs> oh, for, uh, it's eye eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And what is that? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a treatment for trauma. Um, it uses bilateral stimulation. So um, we either do like eye movement. I saw you did a TikTok on that. It was really mm-hmm. funny. <laughs> 
<laughs> or tapping, um, or you can listen to like sounds back and forth. Um, and so you do this bilateral stimulation um, with a therapist as you think about a difficult memory and it helps you to process that memory and, and gain insight around it and, and heal um, from it and kind mm -hmm. of reduce the emotional ties that you have to it. Right. Yeah. And I do apologize, Jennifer. I'm like, what's that? What's that? <laughs> and also like, like doing the podcast, like I, I tend to, I try listeners yeah. to listen back to the episodes and give myself some critical constructive feedback. And one thing I have heard from my sisters who aren't therapists and my friends mm -hmm. who aren't therapists, they're like, I'll ask them a couple of weeks ago, I had Katie Bernoy on, she talked about vicarious trauma. And oh, I just, yeah. we continued in the conversation. <laughs> I was re-listening with help from my sister, trying to get her feedback as well. And I said, do you know what vicarious trauma is? And she was like, I have no idea. And I was like, wow. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. the questions. Thank you for uh, responding. So nicely. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So mindfulness, somatic approaches, mm -hmm. EMDR over here. And right, even as you're talking, when you said mindfulness, I like, I took a deeper breath, like even nice. the word, it just helps. <laughs> yeah. And how do you integrate these with treating codependency? Yeah. Um, it, with setting boundaries, I just like to talk with clients about, um, well, where do you feel like when you're talking to your mom on the phone and it's been a long time and you want to get off the phone, like, where do you feel that in your body? You know, so if you can kind of figure out like how you're feeling in your body um, and then listen to your body and your body will tell you when you need to set a boundary with mm -hmm. something. Right. Yeah. And I mean, even earlier today, <laughs> I, was, I was having <laughs> coffee with someone and they asked me something and I was like, internally, I was like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's professional. It's, I can do it. I don't really want to. Yeah. Did I say that? No. No. I was like, yeah. maybe. <laughs> That's and a better answer than yes. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. And so with a client, you would really help them. It sounds like develop the awareness, mm -hmm. right? Because codependence, I would argue that we don't know initially that we don't want to do something. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So first it's developing, right. That mindfulness, mm -hmm. like, Oh, I actually don't want to go to this, do that, be with, stay here. And then with the somatic approach, you really help them focus in on where does that know start like where's mm -hmm. that feeling correct yeah yeah and sometimes we don't know until after the fact you know like really figure it out but we're trying to get there yeah 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 I don't know if I really wanted to have that coffee <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Oh my gosh. One of your TikToks, I was looking at it, the one with the dog licking on you. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh no, that, <laughs> that's it's feeling familiar right now. Right. So everybody knows Jennifer's talking about, um, I did a, a funny TikTok with my brother-in-law's dog. Mm -hmm. She's a licker. And so, yeah, I, I tried to to draw a boundary. And I was like, Callie, you can't lick me, but then it's so cute. Yeah. So she starts, but she doesn't <laughs> stop. And then she just like goes crazy. So that's what happens when we fail to maintain a boundary. Yeah. Right. And how often do you see that with your clients where you, they identify, okay, actually, I don't want to do this. You walk them through, this is how it feels in your body. This is how you would tune and attend to that and draw the boundary. 
and sometimes they regress and just screw it and they just let it slide. Yeah. Yeah. I like to um, also like help them out with scripts that they can use to express the boundary. Mm. Do you do that also? Role play helps. Practicing helps. Mm -hmm. I sense I have had listeners come on for the codependent dilemma Mm -hmm. and I'll walk them through trying to think Michelle she was trying to say no for those who remember to she has a job Michelle hi Michelle and she's also she was a plumber Mm -hmm. and so people ask her to come and help with their plumbing oh yeah I saw that one yeah (laughs) she's so busy (laughs) she can't and so I think walking through okay this is what you'll say these are the options you can give Mm -hmm. and I sense for everybody, especially with my, my therapy clients, and I will try and integrate this more into the dilemma. Also pr- like playing and role playing through what's the worst that could happen. And yeah, if someone let, okay, so I'll be the angry person. I'll be the angry mom. Oh yeah. I did that with Alejandra actually for codependent dilemma. And so, yeah, I really do try to recreate their worst fear I like that. Yeah. So they can at least, because I think a part of them unconsciously is preparing for that or terrified Mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. They don't even, they don't even say anything. It's like, well, let's, (laughs) let's see, let's see how that would go. I've had some of those fears come true sometimes in the past. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I had a bandmate that I was telling um, that they were, I was kind of confronting them about something that being late and like double booking a lot. And, and then they told me to shut the F up. (laughs) So it can be scary, especially if you've had like past experiences where people explode on you about it. Yeah. Right. And I, it can be scary. And as codependents trying to heal, we can take that shut the fuck up as evidence for, okay, this is why I don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Or this is evidence for me growing, asserting myself, drawing boundaries. Mm -hmm. This is also what happens when I do draw boundaries sometimes. It is not rainbows and butterflies. Yeah. And also evidence that I need healthier bandmates. Yeah. As opposed to shutting the fuck up. For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. Right. Perspective. (laughs) And how do you work with codependency with your clients? Um, yeah, so I use, um, in addition to kind of what I talked about already with the somatic stuff and mindfulness, I use CBT um, sometimes. So, what's CBT? Oh, what's CBT? Cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. So it's a pretty common uh, therapy that most therapists know how to use. Um, and you kind of identify thoughts and feelings and how they're connected. Um, and figure out how to reframe your thoughts so you can feel more balanced um, using affirmations um, and so statements like that help you feel better basically positive statements and um, also the downward spiral technique with cognitive behavioral therapy where you kind of get to the limiting belief that might be there. Like, well, what does this say about you? If you say no to this, what does it say about you? Or if you say, um, you know, turn down this job, or if you are not overworking in school, right? More working way more than everybody else, way more than you need to, then what does it say about you if you're just working the, the right amount, mm-hmm. you know? 
Right. So getting to that limiting belief and then they might say, well, I'm not, I'm not good enough if I don't work more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mindfulness, somatic, EMDR, CBT. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and when your clients come, do they often self-identify as codependent or is that something that they learn in their work with you? Yeah, not usually. Um, they, yeah, usually learn it in their work with me. I did have one um, guy actually come in that identified that way. So how did he know? Yeah. Um, a partner told him. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> and he was receptive or defensive about that label? Mm, I'm not sure. It's, it's a possibility he was defensive at first, but obviously he can, you know, accepted it mm-hmm. and then found it helpful and was able to um, set some boundaries. So, right. Yeah. And how come you sense? the majority of your clients don't come in knowing they're codependent? Uh, I think they think of it in a different way. Like the way I was talking about at the beginning, they think of it as being just attached, you know, maybe overly attached, dependent on people, but uh, it's much more complex and there's just so much more to it than that, you know? so I think most of them think that they have anxiety. Uh, I think like you've talked about before, anxiety, depression, you know, stress, they're all symptoms, guilt, they're all could be symptoms of codependency. Right. So, so really looking at what are you anxious about? Mm-hmm. Why are you depressed? Yeah. Like, what are you guilty for? Mm-hmm the, the root of your shame. Mm -hmm. And if it tends to be people at the cause end of that, there might be some codependency. Yeah. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention. I also, I did family therapy when I worked at the drug rehab. So I think I really got to see a lot of codependency going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of um, kind of enabling the addictions um, and allowing, you know, their their child to stay in their house while they're using, they're resistant to kind of doing the tough love work that they mm-hmm. might, that it might be more helpful for them. It's really challenging though. I can imagine it must be, be difficult being a parent experiencing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, I feel like we could spend a whole episode talking about family therapy Yeah. for dynamic family or yeah, for codependent families. Oh yeah. You did family too. Family therapy too. huh? Yeah. And I also have, and still am at times very codependent with my family mm-hmm. and they have been very codependent with me and yeah, it's, it's related. I mean, do you, do you sense codependency can even exist without a family? No, (laughs) so yeah, it's all interrelated. (laughs) Like people like to kind of think of the, the addict or the codependent or the, you know, the person that's mentally ill as like the problem in the family and then kind of separate it from them. But it has to do with like, as you know, the dynamics in the, in the family. Mm -hmm. So the blame can't just be placed on, on one person. No, that's uh, what they call scapegoating. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to add something? Uh, well, I was, I was kind of thinking that I feel like I'm putting my family on blast here, but I, I feel like, um, 
like I almost kind of feel and express all the dark feelings for my family, Mm -hmm. you know, in a way. Right. Yeah. I feel like we could talk about that for an hour. Yeah. (laughs) And so I guess, yeah, we'll just have to have you back. And until then, right. Just this, just emphasizing for everybody, dear listener, I know I experienced this a lot throughout my early 20s. I really blamed, I thought I was such a problem. I was so crazy. And Jennifer is saying, and me too, you are not an island. Yeah. Right? You are a country with multiple <laughs> borders that have been open, just just in and out free flowing. And like, it is all interrelated and you can point the finger at yourself. Other people can point the finger at you. And yet you are the consequence of, right? Like you said, abuse, parentification, being in a home without feelings being accepted. Oh gosh. You talked about another Con- contributor, which is eluding me. Different types of abuse, mm-hmm. emotional abuse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now we're trying to build boundaries, mm-hmm. healthy, healthy, yeah. healthy borders <laughs> <laughs> for codependence. But let's just get fucked up instead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> healthy boundaries. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. And where can people find you? Um, I'm on uh, jennymarie.org, J-E-N-I-M-A-R-I-E.org. That's my website. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. We'll put that in the show notes and till next time. Okay. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Episode 25. Check. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, please remember, if you are feeling unseen, I see you. If you are feeling unheard, I hear you. And if you think that you don't matter, know that you matter to me. I want you to go out there so you can stop playing small and start taking up space. This is Marissa, your hostess mostess. Be sure to check out www.codependummy.com for resources. And you can follow me. I'm no longer, well, at Codependummy is on Instagram to simplify my life. All posts for the podcast will be on my practice Insta at therapy with Marissa and I will see you all next week you're still here just kidding girl this is not therapy and I'm not your therapist okay this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered it is given with the understanding that neither the host the publisher or the guests are rendering any legal, clinical, or other professional information. If you want or need a professional, you should find one.